he's telling some truths. For sure. He's absolutely telling some truths. The most important thing that he said was that as a business, sports ownership is irrational. It absolutely is. Fandom is irrational. The idea of owning a sports team as a business. What bothers me is the presumption of saying fans want this, fans want that. You can't be guided by the fans. You can't tell the fans what they want and why they want it. And every market is different. Every sport is different as far as what fans can accept as okay enough. I also take issue with a couple things. I take issue with twice invoking batting average. Because that that just sort of tells you gener- generationally where we are. Uh, uh, just because a guy hits two oh two doesn't mean he's bad, but this is this, he's still operating from a long time ago. And this idea of you know three hits and ten it, that's two references to batting average. Which, I, I would say is when it comes to winning divisions, his batting average is way below that, way way below two hundred and way below three hundred. The other aspect is characterizing somebody who wants to spend on a second baseman as dumb. Where where once you have said logically, once you've said that sports ownership is irrational, you can't call Steve Cohen dumb. But that's what he's doing. Because it's not dumb to a gazillionaire who wants to win. Correct. And has, and has taken his team as a public trust. It's not dumb to the Padres. They're doing what they want to do in sports. It may not be the best business decision, but Jerry has already said, he said, you're stipulating to irrational. If you are, once you say that, you now can't say it's dumb to spend that money on a second baseman. Because those are those are different things. So he is telling some truths in there, but he's also showing his ass as he's doing that. You, you can't have it both ways. I understand all the inherent conflicts in sports ownership, and they are legion. This idea of, well, I've you know, made this massive investment. I've got partners. I've promised not to lose their money. I've promised not to take out loans. I've promised not to... to to hurt their investment. I'm a steward of this based on our partnership arrangement. I get all of that. But then there are things you have to admit about what you will do and what you won't do. And I think he he got close to doing some of that too. I, I also don't like what, what he said at the end. Well, in, in, in the middle there where he's talking about the second, third, or fourth, the White Sox have had one season where I think that has been accurate. And that's the 2006 season where the team won 90 games. They finished in third place. That's a good season. You know what? That was a blast of a season. It too. really was. That was really fun. But other than that, that was got Tommy and all yeah. that. that. That was, and the place was rocking. Yes. Because of what had happened in 2005. You know what else was a great, the, what about the Torborg season? I mean, 85 was a really fun season. Was it 91? That the really, like the last year in old Comiskey, was at 90 when they won? They, the, the Oakland ran away with it, but the White Sox won 90 some games and they were, it, and, and they tried. But there aren't many years like that. Most of the years when you're finishing third or fourth, those are miserable years for your team, your franchise, and for your fans. And it speaks to what the characterization of Jerry Reinsdorf has been. And, and, and what David Sampson had said about him years ago, where he talked to, when talking to him when he first got into the baseball business, Reinsdorf saying that, you know, it, it just finished second. Fans want to know that you're all in on this as the steward of the franchise, as the owner, as the managing partner. I have always felt like from talking to multiple people inside the White Sox organization, when whether it's it's on the record or off the record, or people telling you Jerry really, really wants to win. And I've kind of felt like, okay, I mean, it makes sense. This is someone who grew up with a love of baseball, and there's the big history between the White Sox and the Dodgers because Jerry grew up a Brooklyn Dodger fan and all of that stuff. And it's nice to say. And, and I think that he would rather win than not. But it's hard to believe that he has a thirst for winning. 
And when you hear him try to break it, to break down sports ownership in such a clinical way, but also being snarky about it, it, it comes off as being tone deaf. Right now, and that's the other part, the scheduling of this. And I'm, I'm sure that he's scheduled this six months, to a year in advance, that he had no idea that his team was going to lose 10 in a row. And then he was going to be in front of people talking about what was going on with, with baseball ownership. It's just a bad look. He, you know, we, we joke about, we, in the last segment, we were joking about how, you know, there, there's something almost regal about the Bears ownership and that they're detached from the real people of the South lots. Jerry's like that too. Mm -hmm. But Jerry tries to act like he's an everyman. He, wa he wants you to think that his, his franchise is the franchise of the everyman. But he doesn't treat us as fans like that. Well, that's he treats us like we're beneath him. Well, that's why when he says the, that's the famous trope of you can't listen to the fans or you'll be sitting with the fans. That is not about ownership. That trope is about coaching. That when I've heard that before, for him to invoke that from an ownership perspective, fans can't force you to sell the team. You're not gonna right. Be, I mean that you that, that you you own the team. That's usually said about coaches and personnel guys. Right, where where they can't they can't necessarily like follow their gut on everything because there's numbers that probably I, will give them a better opportunity. Yeah, some so stuff that fans not, might not know in the moment. I'm not granting him the facile use of of that that trite phrase because oh, you can't listen to that. You'll be sitting next to him. That's what they say about about coaches and GMs. Although, and and this this is the truth. You know, full you know, full full honesty here. Full disclosure, we make fun of fans, and we make fun of dumb fans all the time, right? Yep. And we do it a voice, and we talk about this Bridgeport and the Sox fans and the meatballs, right? We do it, because it's fun. And Die it's, hard, and Sox fans. And it's funny. But these are the same fans that were literally telling Tony La Russa to pinch run Adam Engel. Yep. And I don't care where you sit. There are a lot of people at Sox games who are on top of Everything that know the game that are there thinking the game are, through I'm, as it's going on, I, and 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 know that the last guy that you just called up from Charlotte, whether it's Tanner Banks or whoever it is, that they know like there are a lot of really informed, intelligent White Sox fans. I mean, we deal with we deal with them every day. We deal with them, and, and we're we're getting text messages and and twitches, and we're getting emails from these fans that we're talking about, which is another reason why all of it is so insulting. It would be one thing. And, and if the White Sox were regularly successful as a baseball franchise, if Jerry wanted to come down and talk about the, the, the ways of the world and how a well-run baseball team works fine, you don't have the track record, sir. As the managing partner, as the owner of the White Sox, you don't have a track record over the last 15 years of your franchise being run well. And part of that, part of that is like it's so funny to me because he he's trying to to talk about the two sides as if he hasn't been tap dancing on the line between them. The fan part, the loyalty part. The lack of running a, a sports team like a business has allowed for him to keep people employed that haven't earned the right to keep their jobs. And that doesn't say to me that you want to win. That says to me that you're functioning, that you're trying to function as a business, but you're using ideas that are more suited for fandom. You know what? I like this guy. This guy's all right. He it's fine. Let him keep doing what he's doing. We're not losing any money because of it. Then in the same breath, he wants to act like it should be more cold and calculated and and you're only as good as your dumbest competitor and that that competitor is your partner. Well, guess what, Jerry? A lot of people are looking at you as the dumb competitor. Now, a lot of people are looking at the White Sox as the team that you don't want to emulate. That you don't want to set the market on Mike Clevenger on Thanksgiving? Right. All of this stuff. Like, your team did that. 
You don't want to constantly give multi-year contracts to interchangeable and replaceable veteran relief pitchers. Right. Dan, the White Sox, after last week, there are only three teams that have never given out a $100 million contract, and the White Sox are one of them. How in the world do you plan on competing? If you want to be the Rays, okay, then you need to hire people that are that are forward thinking. Then you need to hire people that are figuring out ways to win in the margin. Yeah, you can do it. Like you can actually be a prudent steward of your partner's asset and win. Yep. Like that's the thing. It's not necessarily It's not binary. Right. They're not they they don't just kind of compete whenever because this is how they've chosen to, they, it is they haven't done it well you can you absolutely can you can be in the conversation you just have to be really good at the baseball stuff right they haven't done it well and he hasn't always treated the team like a business there have been times when he's treated the team like a fan 